Good morning. My name is Theron Cole. This is BelieversFoundationMinistries.com and today is November 2nd, 2023, the year of our Lord. <clears throat> this morning, I have many areas that are in my heart to cover and we'll see how the Lord puts this all together, but this is really juicy stuff. It's very important to understand how everything works and fits together. One of the problems with why a number of people can't uh, take on their Christian life with vigor is because they don't understand why certain things matter. The meaning escapes them. So, in the making of ourselves as a disciple, and our Lord Jesus says, go and make disciples, that's a little different. It's an additional responsibility to simply, I shouldn't say simply because that isn't, it isn't simple. Um, that's, a, that's a different order of behavior in those of us who are instructing according to the Word of God or bringing people into the Word of Truth, into the service of our Lord, bringing them into this magnificent new life through the Gospel. Um, so you can present the Gospel to someone and they'll have an experience and then you move on to the next town where you teach there and, and you hope that the churches in the places where you have taught are able and willing and ready to pick up the new convert and disciple them. But the discipling process isn't something that is actually picked up by most churches. There is teaching that goes on. There's a place for you to meet fellow believers. There are classes for you to take to learn more. But the actual process of discipling is one that our Lord gave as an example to us with regard to how he was with his apostles. There was a commitment on the part of the people who become discipled. At some point, they began to understand that this was the way of life that they wanted. They wanted him in their life in an abundance and first place. And the discipling process then begins in earnest. So, as a child of God and as a disciple in progress, there are different levels of discipling and there are different um, uh, commitments that you make as you go along. You will make more and more and more of a commitment to the Lord as you progress. And that is good. You give Him more and more of your heart you make him more and more your master in all things. Until one day, your life has taken on such a remarkably different tone than it had when you first came into this. That's the discipling process. And it is a commitment, and it is something that should be done at some point consciously. Now, I know that the Lord doesn't neglect us once we've come to Him, and He pulls us along, leads us along. He enables us to come into more and more understanding. But at some point, the desire to grow in Him involves a commitment whereby you leave off more of the world on purpose and you come in closer to Him on purpose. And that is the beginnings of the commitment for the discipling process. A disciple and a teacher 
are both committed. The teacher commits and the disciple does too. Now, when God says go and make disciples, I see this as uh, the Lord is our shepherd, so the discipling process is all under his headship. There are schools set up in our nation now by different peoples to teach certain things that that individual who sets up the school may be gifted in. And so that individual is imparting what they have to give specifically. And in order to get that teaching, you would have to go through their teaching. Ultimately, it's the Lord that disciples you. You have the Holy Spirit in your heart, and the Lord disciples you. The Lord gets you where you need to be and puts you before who you need to be put before and who you need to glean from. But understand that as each commitment that you make to him to pull away from the world and to come closer to him sometimes requires more teaching or different teaching than what you've been hearing. But the Lord supplies. But it is a discipling process, and we have to look at it that way. I don't see our culture having the disciple process exactly the way the Lord did it. Uh, we do have some foreign cultures that set up discipling processes that way, uh, but we don't hear but I know that God is faithful. So for those who have a commitment to be disciples, then there's a way to go. My bigger concern here is about how to offer the discipling process in obedience to the Lord's command. Go and make disciples. So these teachings that I give forth are a lot of them pretty meaty. And for those on the discipling process, they can be very useful. Ultimately, that's where my heart is, is for the making of disciples. For the connecting of an individual to the big picture, the bigger picture that God would have you have, that makes it impossible to turn around and walk away, at least not accidentally. A disciple holds fast and holds true, and that's what I desire for all of you. That was a poem. <laughs> a disciple holds fast and holds true, and that's what I desire for all of you. Hallelujah. Matthew 6, starting in verse 19. What we're going to be taking a look at today is a, a progression of things that appear to be isolated incidents or isolated issues, but they are not. They are all connected. They are all one thing. It is the heart that God speaks about so clearly and so fervently, your sight, and I would include your hearing and who will you serve? Who are you going to serve? Your service to God is contingent on your heart being where it's supposed to be and your sight and your hearing being correct. Now, this doesn't happen overnight. This is a process. You have been trained to see things the way the world sees things. And you don't even know it. You've been trained to hear things the way the world hears things. What God in you now, by the Holy Spirit, 
will be teaching you over a period of time and probably has at some point already is that this hearing you can begin to hear what the Holy Spirit would have you hear while you're hearing something that the world is conveying to you. You hear something on the news and the Lord speaks to you through that and you go, oh, that's what that is. He begins to show you what things really are in Him. And you hadn't had that before. See? So this is the schooling the discipling process of the Holy Spirit in your heart to give you the sight and the hearing that you need. Now these two work together perfectly, sight and hearing. And I have often said for many years that you can that when you hear, you're seeing, and when you see, you're hearing. The two work together. God, when he shows you something or when you see something, he'll talk to you. You're going to hear about what you see. And our Lord practiced this. And I'm going to show you that too. Now, when you have the Lord's changes on your heart and you embrace his ways with a willing and obedient heart. It changes the way you see. Your perspective alters deeply and your hearing alters deeply. At some point you will hear and then you're going to be able to hear under that or over that or around it. You're going to hear what's really being said by the Spirit. You aren't going to hear voices, not in the way that people say who are being led about by spirits that are of the demonic realm. They do talk too. But the Holy Spirit has a certain voice that you will become schooled to as you continue in the Word of God. As you continue in the Word of God and you continue to release yourself from the world, from the world's ways, <clears throat> from the world's attitudes, then the Holy Spirit's voice in you begins to become very strong. It, he comes and uh, I've, I've had, he speaks to me in knowings, and I don't know how else to explain that. They're knowings with words. The knowings that he gives me have words to them. There will be things that I know, and if someone said, what is that that you know, that you now know? I, I could put it into words. I would have words for that knowing. But he gives me an understanding right away, a knowing right away. And this is how he talks to us, in large part. Uh, he, is the, he is called the Spirit of Truth, and He is. And that knowing is truth, and you know it. And you know it when you hear it. You know that truth when you hear it. I mean, you know that it's the truth. Once you've received the true truth into your heart, our Lord, once you've accepted Him into your heart and you are born again, now all of the other truths begin to be made obvious or visible eventually by the Holy Spirit. He opens you up to all truths. Our Lord knew as he walked along certain things. Now he didn't know immediately everything all at once, but you only need to know there's a need to know basis that your life experience provides. When you are where you are, you only need to know what you need to know. And that will become open to you at the time that you need to know it. You don't have to be frantic about it. You don't have to be fearful. You don't have to be um, apprehensive or any, any of the other emotions that are tied to anxiety. You don't have to have any of those feelings. When you need to know, he lets you know. And then when you know, there's no fear with it. I've had more than one situation where I've needed to know something 
about a situation that was very serious that I had no anticipation of, and the Lord has guided me away from that situation by saying, this is what's going on, this is what you need to do, just do this, and I was done. And I was safe. Okay, so these, this is how he can do you. He does people in many different ways. I came up to an intersection, and it's happened more than once, and was enveloped by a very peculiar sense. That's the best word I can put on it. And it said in my heart, hold still. Well, I didn't move. I didn't move. And in this one particular instance, while I stayed in the middle of that intersection, the light changed. I mean, I'm in that intersection now, uh, and I shouldn't be. But over the hill, right in front of that intersection, shoots a car. And he's going probably, hmm, maybe 70, 60, 70, like a flying by. Would have broadsided me if I'd been in the middle of that turn, and I would have been if I'd been turning. Because the light had changed before I could turn because the traffic was too much. And then this person comes right over the hill. Well, he comes over the hill and he shoots over the hill and he's past me in seconds. And then I just made my turn. Everybody else waited because I'm blocking the intersection. Then I make my turn and I go on. Nothing has happened, but everything has happened. So, this is a tale of two kingdoms. We have the kingdom of the world that has a king. It's the enemy. And the name of his kingdom is the kingdom of hell, and it exists. And it's right here, right now. And it is eternal too. Because the people that go over into that kingdom are going to be in that kingdom for eternity if they don't come out. And then we have another kingdom right here too. And it's the kingdom of God. And it has a king too. And that's our Lord Jesus Christ. And we are going to be in that kingdom for eternity as long as we remain here in this kingdom and don't step out into the other kingdom. There are kingdoms of the earth that involve nations that have heads who guide them. But there are only two kingdoms in the spirit. And those two kingdoms, each of them, want your attention. And they work at getting it, both of them. The kingdom of hell wants to take you captive. It wants to bond your attention to horror, cruelty, abuse, bad experiences of every kind. It wants to lock you in and take you captive so that you can't get out of that. But the kingdom of God is about freedom from the kingdom of hell. It's about undoing the works of the enemy right in front of the enemy's face. Jesus said he came to undo the works of the enemy, of the evil one. So the evil one is busy, 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 and so is our Lord. Matthew 6, starting in verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, this is a fabulous chapter. I really admonish you seriously to read the whole thing. 
but right now we are concentrating on three points, well, three primary points. I usually have little outroads on each of these points, but it's important that we hold fast to these three because they work together. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy. What you do in this place where we are now, this construct that God has put us in, you do for eternity. Now you will either be an eternity spent with God the Father or an eternity spent in hell. But it is for eternity that we operate here. That which you do for God is laid up for you. You don't always see the end result of that one, but you have to trust him and you have to believe what he says and you have to give him your heart. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now we are told in the word that we're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our might. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me. You see, your heart is where your loves are. Now, I learned a long time ago watching my grandparents were professional people watchers. <laughs> when I say professional, I mean they did things throughout the day if they could, if they had the time to, whereby they invested themselves in people watching. They'd pack a lunch, they'd have a picnic, they would go downtown, they would park on a, on a side street that was heavily trafficked, and they would have lunch there, and they would discuss the traffic. They watched people. I've been watching people a lot too. And God has been talking to me about people for many years. People are guided by what they love. If you can find what a person truly loves, you're going to know what makes that person tick and the principles upon which they act. Not everyone is motivated by the same things, but the primary things that a person is motivated by are absolutely empowered by and produced by the principle by which they love. Now, you think love's pretty straightforward, but it isn't. Not in the minds and hearts of people who are perverse. Their loves are all twisted. They have a love guiding them too. It's hard to believe it because they're so unloving. They don't the word tells us that figs and grapes are not gathered from thorns and thistles. They don't give the fruit of God forth. They're stickery. They're horrible, difficult, worse than difficult. We're talking evil here. They stick you, they stab you, they sting you. Okay? They're not good. Not good. Doesn't mean they can't become good if they receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior and repent fully of their former ways, they could become good. But until such time, they are not good and shouldn't be deemed good. But they love too. And you'd say to yourself, well, how is that possible? Because love is kind and love is, yes, all those things are true. But not to them. Their love has a different definition than your love. So, and I believe it's in the 14th chapter of Corinthians, if I'm not mistaken. It's in Corinthians. Paul outlines a basic general idea of what love is like. Love is patient. Love is kind. All of these things. But people that are of thorns and thistles, they love too. But you can't equate their love 
to the love that God gives to the heart of a person who obeys him. He puts his love in you. You see, you can love because he loved you first and set you free from the kingdom of darkness and those thorns and thistles that were on your heart and in your heart, you don't have to buckle your knees to anymore. You don't have to bow to that stuff anymore. You are free from the chains of darkness that sin has put on your heart because of who you've been following and whose kingdom you've been under. You've been set free of that now. Now you're in the kingdom of light. Your heart. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That is where your love will come from. Okay? So you understand what he's saying now. All right. So what he's telling you here is start laying up for yourself according to the kingdom of God and what God values because he's your love. He's your treasure. Okay, so this takes a lot of time thinking about it, taking stock of your own ways, looking at them, evaluating them, evaluating your own motives, and being honest. Honest about your motives. If you've got a creepy motive, admit it to yourself. God already knows. You're the one that's the slow one to come around to it, not him. He already knows, and he has a fix. It's when you continue to try to hide it and dress it up. I mean, if you can't hide it, decorate it, right? Dress it up and make it look like it's something else. Wrong. That is not something you're to be doing. Don't dress it up and try to make it look like something else. God already knows it's there. You're already naked before him, so you might as well find out what he wants you to do about this thing that you can't seem to let go of. Of course you can't let go of it. It's stuck to you. That's what the world does. It sticks to you. It's kind of like a glue board. And if you don't know what a glue board is, it's like fly sticky paper, only worse. But it's like that. And whatever gets stuck to it can't get out. It's like a huge giant spider web. And once you attach to it, you can't get out. And there is something coming to eat you. So you don't want to stay there. What sticks to you has got something on the other end. And you're not going to like the results of that. And if you think of it as a giant spider that's going to eat you, then you know you don't want to be stuck with it. You don't want it sticking on you. So you've got something stuck in your heart and you can't get it out and you've wrestled and wrestled with it. It's too big for you. So act like the little kid that you are and go to God. He's our Father. And say, I can't get this off me. It's horrible. I know it's bad and I keep doing it. Help me and mean it. Okay, so the heart. That's for the sticky areas. The world is sticky. And it, listen, the enemy knows very well what he has sown out there in that world. He has sown all manner of things that are going to stick to you like glue and are going to be hard to get off. He's busy, busy, busy about his work. And we, as the children of God, need to be busy, busy, busy about our work, which is doing the will of the Father believing on him who he approves. And that is our Lord Jesus Christ. The one whom he approves and the one whom he sent, we are to believe on him. And that means that we do his will, that's our food. And Jesus told us that when he was standing at the well with the woman of Samaria, and the disciples came back, and I've told this story many times, and they said to him, you know, he, he, he told them that he had food that they knew not of. And they said, well, have you eaten? Because they hadn't been back there to give him any food. And then he says what he says. So you need to read that one, which is a good one. The woman at the well in Samaria should not be too hard to find, and I can't, it's in the, you know, well, it's, it's in the Gospels. So, that's to do the will of the Father is our food. 
We also have other foods, and I'm going to do this one. <laughs> I just can't get off this one for a minute. This is such deep stuff. You can train yourself to eat things you ought not eat. There's good food and bad food. When I say that this is our food, to do the will of the Father, that's good food. That's choice food. That's the best food. That's the nourishment that we should be nourishing ourselves with. What God has given us to do. And he feeds us. He will feed you in your deep parts of your heart. And this Christian walk is so exciting. More so than you can... You're never going to run out of opportunities to be thrilled by this walk, in this walk. The Holy Spirit sees to that. He keeps you very interested. Thank you, Jesus. But the opportunity to pick up bad food and to nourish yourself according to bad food or with regard to bad food is all around us. The enemy has bad food laid around for all sorts of people to eat if they choose to eat it. Okay? A lot of people uh, are nourished or puffed up, become puffed up by doing bad things to other people. And this is how they've become wicked. They've been eating bad food. A bad person, a wicked person, is feeding on a bad diet. They are being built up and puffed up by things that they should not be consuming, but they do. They get so excelled at it that as they continue on this road, uh, they become extremely... Uh, these are the uh, thorns and thistles that oppose the way of the truth. So they become enemies and are enemies of God. Now the very next thing that he talks about, for it says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The very next thing he speaks of here is the eye is the lamp of the body. Verse 22. You see, your value system, you need to check it out. You need to look at your value system. Because your value system, where your heart is, what you value as a treasure, what you believe has value, that's what a treasure is. What is it that you value? What is it that you put uh, your heart behind? Are these... This is why the building up of character is so important. Courage, loyalty, diligence, uh, honor. These are all things God wants built up in your heart. All these qualities will be built up in your heart as you continue to prefer Him over what the enemy is offering. So your heart is going to be with what you value most. And then he says, the eye of the lamp is the body is of the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Where your heart is affects how you see, how you see things. Your emotions are attached to how you see things. Now your emotions are not to be your God, but they are powerful forces within you, and they will guide you in different ways. They will confuse you sometimes, they'll mess you about by their conflicting. You may have a lot of issues with your emotions, but they're not your God. So we make our decisions with the spirit of truth in our heart, and if the emotions rise up against it, well then, you're going to have to plow through that, and it may not be easy. 
Getting a handle on the emotions in order to do sometimes what God wants you to do can be a difficult thing. But if we're not cautious, we will allow those emotions to be our guide. Your emotions can be trained. It just takes a while. And they do come around. It just takes a while. You have to understand that. Numbers 22 Starting in verse 20, there was a, a prophet of God who was also a sorcerer. Now, I find this man fascinating because his name was Balaam, because God went to him, used him. He was known to be a prophet, but he was also known to be a sorcerer. Now, there's some confusion there in the way, let me put it this way. There's confusion in the way these things are ordinarily taught because most people teaching them don't know what they're talking about. And that's the truth, sadly. So these things have to be understood. They have to be understood. If you don't understand these things, then it's very difficult to get the big picture and some other things. So I'm going to explain this in a minute. Let me put it this way. A lot of the teaching that I had received prior to the Spirit of God teaching me was very weird about witchcraft. Most people think that witchcraft is something that uh, draws people out on Halloween or it's something that people do conjuring. And, and there is an element of it that, that involves this where they take little you know, things and conjure things and try to make things happen. Well, all of those are elements of witchcraft, that is true. But the biggest amount of witchcraft that is done in any culture is being done outside of formal witchcraft covens. The majority of it is being done by what you would deem regular people who don't understand what they are doing. Okay, so we're going to get into that in a minute. All right, so verse 20. That night God came to Balaam and said, Since these men have come to summon you, get up and go with them. But you must only do what I tell you. So the warning went to Balaam right away that he was going to have to listen to the Spirit of God, and he had an ability to do that. Spirit of God could talk to him. But Balaam was also a sorcerer. What does that mean? Well, I'm going to tell you flat out, that means that as a sorcerer, he was very skilled at doing basically what he wanted to do. And there was power on it. So he was known to be a sorcerer and someone who could make things happen that this king who comes after him to hire him, essentially, to curse Israel, he already knew that the man could do. But Balaam is also a man of God. Now this is, you would say, okay, well that's impossible that he could be both. Well, you can appear to be both for a while. You can. But the end result of Balaam was not good. And in a previous teaching, having read the entire thing, and you should read this, this is uh, Numbers 22, this is fabulous, you find that Balaam, and it takes a while to find this one out, Balaam has an end. And I don't believe that Numbers 22 covers it. It's somewhere else later in the scriptures. He was eventually killed as a sorcerer. So eventually he got caught up and killed as a result of the sorcery that he refused to let go of. He continued doing it. He continued trying to do God and the sorcery too. 
and he ended up being taken captive and killed. Okay, well now this is a really great story for us because you can kind of appear to ride the fence for a while and everything seems to be okay, but it isn't okay. You have got to begin to make a decision to come over into God's camp and it means that the things that are not of God's camp you need to begin letting go of on purpose. Getting that sticky from the world off of you. Examining where your heart's treasure actually is. It will affect your ability to hear and it will affect your ability to see. Okay now. John chapter 8. John chapter 8, starting in verse 28. Now this is our Lord speaking, and it says here, well in verse 27 it says, they did not understand what he was telling them about the Father. So Jesus said this, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own, but speak exactly what the Father has taught me. He who sent me is with me. He, is not le he has not left me alone, because I always do what pleases him. I do nothing on my own. Now this, is, now this is funny. We get so used to reading scriptures about our Lord that don't seem to make sense, that we're used to reading scriptures that don't make sense at first, and therefore we don't get out of it what we need. And then you will know that I am He, verse 28, and that I do nothing, I do nothing on my own. But speak. He tied his doing with speaking. Right there. I do nothing on my own, but speak exactly what the Father has taught me. His doing had to do with what his father was teaching him as he went along, and at other times, but as he went along. His speaking, but his doing is tied to his speaking, right there. And his speaking is tied to what he's being taught. Where? Inside of himself. God the Father is speaking, and the Son is listening, and speaking, and doing. So you see, everything that came forth from our Lord came forth from His hearing. He hears what the Father said, and He then speaks what the Father teaches Him, and He does. This is so powerful. This is to be how it is with us. Okay. John 14, chapter 10. Just a second here. Um, I want to read this part too, sorry. Verse 30. As Jesus spoke these things, many believed in him. What he was talking was the truth of the eternal kingdom of God. And God was being sent out through his mouth, the truth of it, the Spirit of God. And those who were gods, those who could come, those who had a heart for God, were able to hear and believe. 
That's how powerful that is. That's how powerful that is. Incredible. Incredible. John 14. John 14, uh, chapter, uh, John chapter 14, verse 10. Do you believe that I am the Father, am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own. Instead, it is the Father dwelling in me, performing his works. Now, that's weird, right? Wasn't he talking about speaking? Oh, and now all of a sudden he says works. It doesn't make sense. I would say literarily, or, you know, according to the way we write language, that he's off topic here. I mean, that looks like, I mean, what's this? I mean, all of a sudden he's talking about works. It sounds like I've got an incomplete, I've got a weird sentence here. No. His speaking is tied to his doing. And he speaks because the Father dwelling in him is doing this. Okay, do you believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own. Instead, it is the Father dwelling in me, performing his works. What is he doing in there? He's showing the Son. He's talking to the Son. The work inside of him is the Father. And then what he does is, as the Son, he speaks this out and things come about. He follows the template that his Father gives him by what's going on inside. Oh, this is so good. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on account of the works themselves. He's telling you how it works here. He's telling you how this process in him works. It's very simple, but it's extremely profound. It's profound because it's spiritual, it's eternal, and you can't do this. But you get to participate in it. This is how our Father works. And we're, the Lord here is showing us how this is. Now Jesus had an ability to see and to hear. We're going to go and read this one again, because I've been reading this one now for the past three teachings. But we need to read this one again. This is Isaiah 11, starting in verse 1. Then a shoot will spring up from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit, and the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and strength, the Spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. This is all that was going on in him. This is God the Father. This is who he is. He will not judge by what his eyes see. Now see, you got, you got different sights here. You got the seeing just of the regular eye which sees objects. And he will not decide by what his ears hear. He's already telling you this has all been bypassed. What you were given, the original equipment that you were given has been bypassed now. You're a new creation in Christ. Old things have passed away. And behold, all things have become new. You are now a new entity. And what you see and what you hear is deeper. It's beyond this. It's by God the Father inside the Spirit of Truth, our Holy Spirit. 
and he will not decide by what his ears hear. Now you see, your hearing is what enables you to make decisions. What you see, you are hearing to make decisions. You think you decide by what you see. You decide by what you hear about what you see. And then you decide. Your hearing is powerful. More powerful than your sight, actually. But with righteousness he will judge the poor, and with equity he will decide for the lowly of the earth. This is, and if you, as you continue to read this, this is the righteousness of God. Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. You think God can't take care of your lowly issues here? You know, what you're going to eat and what you're going to wear, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more here. Yes, of course he can. That's, listen, that's, uh, those are the mechanics. God takes care of the mechanics. But don't you let the mechanics consume you. God is beyond the mechanics by a long shot. And God wants you on his team, and he wants you involved in what he's involved in. And he cannot get you there if you're stuck in the mechanics and then, as the word also tells us, that even the heathens chase after these things. They are stuck in the processes. They are stuck in the machinery of what appears to be the now. They are stuck in only what their eyes can see. They are stuck in their original equipment. They're not born again. They don't have new equipment. They don't have the spirit of truth in them. He is... It's the difference between walking along and being in something great that's passing over high above. It's an, a completely uh, different position in the nature of what appears to exist. This is an alteration. It's a dimensional thing. You are going to be living in the same place but you are not going to be occupying the same atmosphere. There's a different atmosphere in a born-again experience. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and slay the wicked with the breath of his lips. Righteousness will be the bell around his, the belt, excuse me, around his hips, and faithfulness, the sash around his waist. Do you think God has integrity? Oh, yes. You think he's faithful to his word? Yes. You think you can trust what he's promised? Yes. And should you? Oh, yes. John chapter 5, starting in about verse 30. This is our Lord speaking. I can do nothing by myself. I judge only as I hear. And my judgment is just, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Okay, right there, you have it. Right there, you have exactly where we are to be. To seek the will of him who sent us. To seek the will of him who's in us. Not our own will, but his will which means you've got to find out what he wants. Now, there are some aspects of what he wants that he's extremely clear about, and he writes about. Our Lord talks to us about these things. And then there are some that the Holy Spirit 
has to give you understanding concerning. They're deeper. I can do nothing by myself. I judge only as I hear. I judge only as I hear. I judge only as I hear. What is he judging according to? The spirit of truth within him. And my judgment is just. It's just because he's listening to God the Father, not himself. This is what he's saying. Because I do not seek my own will. He has laid down the will of the flesh, which is why I have repeatedly, persistently persevered in the teaching of the yeast of the flesh and how the flesh has to be subdued. Paul said, I buffet my flesh daily so that the will of him who sent him, he says, but because I do not seek my own will, my judgment is just. It's just because it's God the Father's. Because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Now we have the word of truth here that will guide us into God's will. And then you've got to conform yourself to that. What I have found about God's will is there have been times where he's talked with me and I knew that there was a way I needed to obey and I didn't want to. But it was the way God wanted me to go. But I didn't want to. But I did it anyway. I did what God wanted anyway. And then, incredible, incredible understanding began to come. I had a situation involving a family member that God wanted me to act in a certain way concerning. And I didn't want to. I wanted to disengage because there was danger there. Great danger, I believed. And God said, no, you cannot do this. And he told me why at the point. And it had to do with inheritance, a spiritual inheritance. It's hard to explain. Like, you can't apply that to every family member. But in the, condition, in the situation of this, it involved a parent. So I had to be, I had to really mind my Lord, my true father. Okay, so this was very hard for me because it involved my child. Okay. So I agreed with God. And I didn't make, I didn't allow my flesh to act out. I didn't allow my flesh. And it was, this was very difficult for me because I believed there was great danger and there was. And then, <laughs> within six months, the individual in question had created a situation all on their own whereby they had to disengage from me. And they did it all on their own. And I was blameless. You have to trust God. You have to trust Him no matter how you feel. You have to trust Him no matter what you think. You've got to trust the Lord. Each individual that comes your way has got to be treated according to the way the Lord wants. And each is different. Be very cautious about developing pat ways that you deal with a certain situation every time. Because the Lord is fresh and He's always new. And each situation has a dynamic of its own that the Lord needs dealt with according to His will. So let it be that you default to His will and not your way. Do you understand that? Default to His will and not your way. Be willing to set your way aside for His will. You have to become flexible at this and so it takes practice. 
And there's plenty of practice throughout the day because there's many, many, many situations that each of us are involved in that enable us to make decisions. Will it be my way or will it be his will? I can do nothing by myself. I judge only as I hear. Now see, he already is saying, I can do nothing by myself. I can do nothing by myself. I judge only as I hear. These two are related. Your doing is involved with how you judge. It's how you see things. Your judging is how you see how you see it. You say you don't judge. You judge constantly. We all do, and we're supposed to. That's what discernment is. That's how you evaluate. We have different names on it. Well, I evaluated the situation, and this is what I decided to do. You see, you're constantly judging, and your doings come forth from that. Your doings issue forth from how you see things, and how you see things is coming forth from what you've heard and what you hear according to how you see. This is all tied together here. It's massive. So you need to be hearing from the Spirit of Truth. You've got to have it. This is a desire that you must embrace as a child of God, to hear from the Spirit of God as to how you are to go. You must encourage His friendship. And you'd learn to do this by reading His Word. Reading the Word of God will get the voice of God into you. It enables, it is the fulcrum by which, it is the grace mechanism by which you begin to tune the fork. A tuning fork is something they used to use to get a sound just right. It'll set the tuning fork of your spirit toward home, toward the Spirit of God. You've got to get that set. And the Word of God, you spend time in the words of our Lord. Initially, I would recommend it. Go right to the Gospels and you read and breathe those Gospels. And get that voice. Hear His voice. Get His voice into you. It'll begin to come back at you. And those words and that voice, and you'll get just right. It'll be set just right. So you've got to get it set just right, but it's not without your doing. So the words I'm speaking to you right now are spirit, and they are truth. And I'm speaking to you according to how the Word of God, the will of God, my Lord, would speak to you. If you love me, he said, you'll obey me. You can't obey a Lord you don't know. You can't obey words you haven't heard. So, often the lazy Christian is a dead one. Wow, that's horrible. It's true. You become too lazy and you, because you believe in a lay it on me God now that you've had an experience and that's all you think is needful you're already in trouble and you don't know you have to make him your treasure your treasure is him love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul so you love his words you love what he says you get him into you, your perception begins to change, how you see things begins to change, how you hear things begins to change, and the voice of God in you begins to become a reality. And I'm not saying that they'll commit you. It would probably be good not to run around and tell everybody, well, God told me this and God told me that. You don't have to report this to other people. This is not needful. This is a relationship that you have with him where he is talking to you all the time. He's in you and you're in him. And now we get to the next part. And this is Matthew. 
So we have seen here, we've been reading starting in Matthew 6. Believe it or not, that's actually what we began with. <laughs> Okay, I was there. I thought I could find it again easily here. Taking a little bit more work on my part. Okay, so Matthew 6, starting in, uh, we started in verse 22. And uh, I'm going to go back. I'm just going to refresh you on this really fast. Because <clears throat> you <clears throat> might have forgotten where we were. We've been covering a lot of ground. Verse 22, the eye of the lamp is the body of the body. Okay, now, so what we were talking about before that in verse 19 was don't store up treasures for yourself on earth. That isn't where your treasure is. All that stuff is going to go away. It's all going to go away. But store yourself up treasures in heaven because that's where we're going. Okay, so you want something there when you get there. I have no idea what this means, by the way. I wish I could share that one with you. I don't know what it means. Does it mean that you're going to be given um, more responsibility or... I have no idea what it means. You know, it doesn't matter. It's important to God. It is important to God that we do this. And that's all you need to know. It's got to be important to you as a child of God that it's important to God. All right. So for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. But as to actually what it means, I don't know, actually. And you know, God isn't that clear. You know, Paul had an idea, and, and that's what's wonderful about reading about him when he talks about his crown. Paul had an understanding or a revelation of what the crown was that he was earning. You know, and, and he gets you all excited, but you don't exactly know what you're excited about. It's just that you read him and you get excited with him, which is really a funny thing. You kind of share in it with him and you go, ooh, ooh, uh, but I don't know exactly what that is. Um, but that's, <laughs> but Paul knew. And so a brother saw something I haven't seen. I haven't seen what this means on the other side, but Paul did. Verse 22, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, and another, uh, the literal translation of this is if your eyes are evil. If you only have the eyes of the world, you have evil eyes. You don't know that. Because what they're feeding you, what you're hearing as a result of what your natural eye is seeing, is bad stuff. It's bonding you to the world. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. In other words, you have no light to see how to go. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Now you say, how is that possible for a light to be darkness? Well, the people in the world actually think they know where they're going. And they're blind as bats. They can't see at all. They see according to what somebody else is doing. They see according to what some psychologist has said. They see, accor they see according to other people. They think they know where they're going, but they don't. In truth, see, these are two kingdoms. The kingdom of the world is dark. The kingdom of God is light. But if a person thinks they're in the light, you know, Jesus told those Pharisees, he said, I, I, I came for, for those that, needed me. I came for those who needed help. I came for those who needed healing. I didn't come for people that were rich and satisfied, basically. The world makes you think you got it all, or at some point it does, or that what you need it has and you can get. That's how it operates. God is saying this isn't, no, no, no. He's saying if you don't have me, and you don't have me in your heart, and you aren't doing what I say and making eternal substance that will be seen in another way that you don't entirely understand, but you know that you're doing the will of God and you know that you're doing what God wants you to do and it's enough. 
and he nourishes you and takes care of you and builds you up and gets you where this, this is this is not of the world it's not the world's ways and Jesus didn't come for people that were getting their satisfaction out of the world he came for those who knew that that wasn't their satisfaction he came for those who were gods you see the people of God know at some point that this world isn't it it isn't all there is and it isn't what they should be striving for now he says here if then the light within you is darkness in other words it's not really light it's really darkness you see the way Jesus talked was he was talking in the natural about the spiritual and he had to talk in terms of the natural to get you then to move into the spiritual a bit tricky you've got to have an ear for it it takes the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit gives you the ear to hear verse 24 now this is important he moves right on into this and if you listen to this as taught by most people none of this makes any sense it doesn't appear as though it's working together it's working absolutely together and it's seamless so now you've got we've already been past the thing about your sight so where your treasure is now your sight because your treasure affects your sight now we're going right into your master so if your heart isn't right and your sight's not right you're not going to have the right master no one can serve verse 24 two masters either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other you cannot serve both God and money or the other term for it is mammon which was the name for an, an ancient God name for riches or stuff things the acquisition of whatever it is the world has to offer you can't serve both now lest there be confusion on this you can be working and making a living in the world and still be serving God absolutely no problem there Paul did it Paul tells us many times that he works his he worked for he paid his own way now we know eventually he probably did this out of offerings to some degree maybe but he says he worked with his own hands he was a tent maker or trained to be a tent maker at one point when he first got saved he was sent away for a few years and he learned how to make tents there what he was actually doing later I don't know but maybe along the same lines you can work and still serve God you can work and make money and take care of your family and still serve God but it's where is your heart and only you are going to really know that if you're devoted to that and trying to build an empire that way and and God has not told you to do this then you're serving another God I actually believe there are some people that God leads and directs in in certain ways financially uh, in order to acquire but it's God's leading uh, and it's generally for a certain purpose or to I don't know but I know that he does this I, I don't put a cap on God he does amazing things but you have to know who you're serving and on, and on whose will you're moving out and behaving you have to know he's telling you it's not possible it's utterly not possible to serve two masters utterly not James the book of James chapter 1 
Okay, so here in verse 1, uh, verse 2, excuse me. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you encounter trials of many kinds. Uh, okay, James. Um, that's kind of hard. Yes, it is. What he's also trying to say here is, if you're encountering trials with regard to your moving out in God, and it's not just because you were difficult or because you're causing problems or because you're doing bad things. Don't be doing bad things and then saying, obviously, this is, I'm being blessed. No, if you're moving out truly in the will of God and you're encountering trials, he says to consider it pure joy. It's almost like it's a validation. What I have found about the enemy is this. Many times the enemy identifies himself before I have a chance to see where he is. In other words, I don't get to find where he is because he stands up and announces himself. He can hardly help it. So when the power of God comes in, the enemy often stands up to rise against it because he cannot control himself. Um, he is a fleshness. I say fleshness because he operates through the flesh of people and therefore without restraint in many cases. But he's an enemy. So it says to consider it pure joy. In other words, you've been validated. <laughs> Because you know that the testing of your faith, okay, now this is it. First of all, I can tell you flat out the testing of your faith doesn't feel good. You got that one? Faith and feelings. Hmm. Well, the testing of your faith is going to produce a lot of feelings once it's tested. Develops perseverance. The testing of your faith develops perseverance. In other words, you're going to have to press through this. Does it feel good? No. What causes you to be able to persevere? Your continual buffeting of the flesh. Now, Paul told us he did this daily. And it produced a perseverance in that man that we all have reaped a blessing from by the Spirit of God through Paul the apostle, the prophet, the administrator. I have a lot of names I could attach to that man. A powerful force for God, actually, that probably covers it all. Allow perseverance to finish its work. Now, another word for this in another translation is patience. Allow patience. Well, patience involves perseverance. Patience involves also diligence, devotion, discipline, the three Ds. The three Ds are very important. Diligence, devotion, discipline. These are all the making of a disciple. That's what this is. This is the making of a disciple here. Allow perseverance to finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Do you understand that one? Lacking nothing. How is that even possible? Well, once you get free from seeing just with the eyes of the outside, you won't be judging according to what the world thinks is perfect. God's conception of perfect is in faith. And the just shall live by faith. Your faith is your, your staying in the faith of God is your perfecter. It's also guided absolutely by the Holy Spirit. He perfects us. He perfects us as we walk by faith in Him. Okay, not lacking anything. And whatever it is you think you lack, it's not important to God. It's not important to God. Whatever it is that you lack, 
that your natural mind is telling you, well, but you need this, or you got to have that, or, you know, stuff. I know people that judge their entire lives on how much stuff they have and look down on people that don't have much. How silly. People are so much more than their stuff. <laughs> but that's how they see everything. It's in terms of stuff and acquisition, and they're greedy. These are greedy people. You can't spend a whole lot of time around them. A matter of fact, you shouldn't be spending any time around them. Verse 5. Now, if any of you lack wisdom, lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault. He's not going to criticize you when he gives you this. He's not going to say, okay, well, I'm going to give it to you, but, and have all kinds of caveats. He is going to give you what wisdom of his you need when you need it. You've got to ask for it, and that means you ask for it in truth. In truth, not just with part of your mind, but with your whole heart. God, I need this. I've got to be able to see. I need help here. He will give it to you. And it will be given to him. Oh, James said the same thing. That's amazing. I call that a witness. Okay, verse 6. But he must ask in faith without doubting, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. Well, how is it that you would be asking and doubting? That man should not expect to receive anything from the Lord because he's double-minded and unstable in all his ways. Why isn't he asking with his whole heart? Why is he doubting? Because there's something else in the way here. What is that? That's a man trying to serve two masters, a man of two thoughts. A man of two thoughts. Now, he talks here, and, and this, James puts it in, in right re respect. The brother in humble circumstances should exalt in his high position. He should know that he has a position secure in God, and this should elevate him in his own thinking, not in arrogance. But the one who is rich should exult in his low position. Understand where you really are and that your money hasn't made you more. Now, he's not saying here that you give it all away. He's simply saying you have to have a certain attitude about the stuff that you have in relation to that stuff. That stuff is not to puff you up. Because he will pass away like a flower of the field. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant, and its flower falls and its beauty is lost too. So too the rich man will fade away in the midst of his pursuits. In other words, it's all going to go away. Blessed is the man, verse 12, who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. So you're seeing right now that as you preserve, persevere through the trial of your faith, that you are loving God because you're obeying him. This is obedience to God here. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey me. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Isn't that beautiful? All right, so we're going to go back into Matthew 6 again. And we're going to see what our Lord has to say here in verse 25. Now he's given us a template. He has shown us 
that our heart has to be right within us, that our heart has to be secure on the right things. It has to be secure in Him. That if your heart is secure on the things of the world, they are going to go away. They are death. So you will have allied yourself with the enemy who is over all dead things. The enemy, one of his names is Beelzebub, which means Lord of the Flies. Flies are all about dead things. Flies are where things are dead, you're going to find flies. Where things are decaying, you will find flies. Okay. The stuff in the world is already decaying. You just can't see it. We understand it because there are civilizations that archaeologists have dug up, and you know that there's been a lot that's gone before you, but and many times it's covered under several feet of earth. It's been dead and buried for a long time. And our rediscovering it doesn't make it brand new. It just gives you a piece of our history to let, it, to, to let you know how long we've been at this. We've been at it a long time. God's been at it a long time. He is one patient entity. Can't outdo God on patience. Then he tells us that our sight is affected. And immediately he talks to us about sight. Once he tells you what to do with the heart, he then talks to you about your sight, because that's the next thing. It's affected. And then the next thing is your master. Yes, your master is chosen by where your heart is and by how you see. So you're choosing the enemy and you're choosing the stuff out there. It's because you don't yet see and you haven't yet secured your heart in God. Okay, so you know where you're off if you have a desire to change. If you have a desire to will according to the will of God, he said, you draw near to me and I will draw near to you. Now, he's promised that. So if you're off and you know you're off and you feel really bad about it, you could beat yourself up for a few days and feel guilty or you could just make a decision to go toward God, open up your Bible and begin getting him into you. You could just do that and act. <laughs> the Catholics have great words for these things. That would be an act of contrition. Then you repent of having taken on the ways of death. You repent and you get your heart straight before God. You have to truly leave these things off, the things of the world. It has to truly be done. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, about what you will eat or drink, or about your body. See, the next thing is he's telling you, all that stuff is going to try to stick to you. I'm telling you, don't worry about that stuff because these are just the mechanics for God. Look at the birds of the air. They will not sow or reap or gather into barns, and yet their heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who are you by worrying? Who are you by worrying can add a single hour of his life and a single hour to his life? Listen, I had something I wasn't going to, this is hard to reveal, so I'm going to try to do it. I don't talk about this hardly ever, but I'm going to tell it now. Many years ago, I had an event in my life that came about as a result of a prayer to God that I believed. I went before God and I came before Him in truth. My life was, I was lost. I had lost my direction in college. I didn't know what I was doing. I I had pressures from different things. It was so long. I went before God in truth, and this is basically what I said to him. I said, I have never doubted you. Now, I was unschooled in scriptures, but I had been raised 
in Sunday school. My mother had taken me to Sunday school and there were elements of that experience that I still knew. And I went to school, Sunday school very faithfully until I was a teenager and then not since then. And now I'm older. Now I was, at that point, I was in my early 20s. And I went before God and I said, I've never doubted you. Now you have to do something for me. You have to do something for me now. And then I said this to him. Basically, I was going to give him my attention every single day until he did something. Every day, I was going to put my mind on him until he did something. And I held fast to that. And on day seven, my entire atmosphere that I lived in exploded. And by that, what I'm saying is, the atmosphere that I had lived in my entire life, the one that I thought I knew, the one that was inside of me, how I looked out, at everything changed in a moment. And all of a sudden, I was looking out at a world with different eyes. And I was looking out at a world I'd never seen before. I'd never seen it before. And I was terrified. I will tell you that God is terrifying. And this was his grace. This was a reward. This was a reward, and I was terrified because I had lost the place where I was. This is how small we actually are. You have no idea how fragile and small you are and naked and tiny and how much you need him. I held fast to him every single day and watched his miraculous, and I mean miraculous behavior on my account. It was astounding. It was terrifying. I was frightened but I managed to get through the days, one day at a time. I lived in a state of miracles for eight years, eight years. And I saw the hand of salvation on my behalf every single day. It was cataclysmic, mind altering in more than one way as you can well imagine. And Perhaps I could say in some regards, I've never actually recovered, but recovered to what? I've never gone back. I went into a type of grieving because what I had had psychologically wasn't there anymore. Everything was brand new and I was terrified. I found out later, because I didn't know the Word of God, and I had to get schooled in the Word of God, and I found out later that God said, come boldly to the throne of God. And I also was told in the scripture that when you come to God, you have to know that He exists and that He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Those things already right there, I did. I didn't know to do it. I did it. Your heart will find a way to God if you're desperate enough. If you have a desire enough to get to God, you're going to find it. He's not going to keep it from you, and you'll know the path to follow. You will know it. So I went boldly to him. I knew that he existed, and I told him so. I'd never doubted him. I would believed as a child. And number three, I put a demand on him. I said, now you have to do something for me now. So what I got, at least according to what scripture said, was a reward. <laughs> Listen, the rewards of God will terrify you. <laughs> he is incredible. And he is worthy of great respect. Tremendous respect. He answered. A kid cried out. And he answered. Okay. And that is not when I bowed my knee to his masterness, to his godhood. 
that was later. This was part of my salvation journey that went on for a long time. It was huge. We are going to read about Simon the Sorcerer. That's where I have to go now. Okay. I want you to turn to book to Acts, uh, chapter eight. Uh, and we begin to see something here. Okay. Now the in the book of Acts, the apostles are acting. <laughs> this is great. We have a lot of acting out in the book of Acts. Um, starting in verse 4, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. They were doing the will of God. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and preached the Christ to them. Now they were already prepared. Jesus had already been there and swept through that city. So these people, they were prepared. The crowds gave their undivided attention. See, attention is a gift. It's a gift of generosity to God. You give God your attention. It is not a nothing. The crowd gave their undivided attention to Philip's message and to the signs they saw him perform. With loud shrieks, unclean spirits came out of many who were possessed, and many of the paralyzed and lame were treated. They were healed by God. So there was great joy in that city. Prior to that time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and astounded the people of Samaria. He claimed to be someone great. So he was very puffed up in his own flesh, which you would have to be to be a sorcerer anyway. I will say this, at some level, usually early on, because it's a demonic thing, that the demons can continue to become greater in that person. You know, a bigger demon can take over a smaller one, and there's no fight there. They're simply overcome, because that's how the demonic realm does itself here. The demonic realm chooses to take over your soul. You have somebody in your life that's a controller, and, and I don't mean just controlling, because there's a level of control that needs to be applied when you take on a responsibility in administration or other places. You've got to be able to take on the job with responsibility, and that requires control. You have to have that. But when someone is working at taking over your soul, and that means diminishing you, putting your, forcing you, stealing your choices, stealing your choices, then that person is what I call a dominator. That is right under the lordship of the enemy. And that is how the enemy operates, and that's how his kingdom operates, by the way. So a large demon will go in if a smaller demon is in charge of something. And if he finds it interesting and it's something he wants, he'll take it over from that smaller demon. And this is how people continue to go into deeper and deeper levels of captivity to the enemy. <clears throat> See, at first you just got, <clears throat> excuse me, at first you may just have small demons 
that are occupying in an area. But as time goes on and as the behavior toward the enemy gets greater, the attention that the upper levels in the enemy's kingdom, they get more interested in you. You become more of a force and the, the big demons, they want, they want big power too. So if you're offering them the body of a human given over to the ways of the devil, the enemy says, ooh, I can work with that. The enemy will take whatever you give him. And it doesn't matter who you've said you bowed your knee to. The enemy will take whatever he has given. Can the enemy occupy a Christian? Well, I have this question for you. At what point is a Christian not a Christian? That question needs to be answered with another question because it needs to be understood that the enemy will take whatever you give him. If you give him yourself after you've supposedly bowed your knee to God, then at what point are you no longer God's? Is God going to keep you safe in the camp of the enemy? Maybe for a while? For how long? I don't really want to know. Do you want to know? Do you want to test that one out? We're actually told not to test the Lord. I don't want to test that one out. I don't want to... How far can I get my toe out there before it gets cut off? What is that? Well, going back to the tests that our Lord had, whereby the one test was what I call the test of presumption. That's an evil thing. You're not to test God. You are not to test God. So you don't test God with that. You don't go over into the enemy's camp. And if you do, if you find yourself there, you get out real fast and you repent. You repent. And that's the only process by which you can get out and get that stuff off you is by repentance. If you don't repent, you got that stuff still hanging on you. And it will trip you up again. You have to repent. Repentance needs to be a part of our Christian way of life. You don't just repent once and then go off on your own and say, Oh, I got this, God. Because you'll find yourself in the enemy's camp very shortly. And some have not known how to come back. At what point does a person lose their salvation if they ever had it to begin with? I don't know. Again, it's not something I want to find out. But I also know from Scripture that there is a point. There's a point where your name can be written out of the Lamb's Book of Life. Emphasis on written out of the Lamb's Book of Life. The Scripture actually says that. Now, you cannot ascribe to once saved, always saved. That's a false doctrine. Those who are kept in the Lord's hand, he says he never emphasis on those who are in the Lord's hand. You can get out of that place on your own. Hence, the writing out of the Lamb's Book of Life, which we, we don't want to go there. Once you're in Him, stay there, stay there, stay there. Learn to obey Him. He claimed to be someone great, verse 10, and all the people from the least to the greatest, heeded his words. All the people. And said, This man is the divine power called the great power. And they paid close attention to him because he had astounded them for a long time with his sorcery. I met one of these. I'm not going to go into it this time. That's a story for another time. But I met a sorcerer standing in a place where a man of God should have been. And all around him thought he was a man of God. But he was a sorcerer. It's the only one that I've actually known that I met. There may have been others out there, but I didn't know. 
But when they believed Philip as he preached the gospel of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed and was baptized. Simon believed and was baptized. He followed Philip closely and was astounded by the great signs and miracles he observed. Notice that he had an experience and was baptized and he followed. So we have several things here that sound very promising. But notice that we are not talking about once saved, always saved here. Verse 14, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. So they're sending in more, they're sending in more recruitment to help. On their arrival, they prayed for them to receive the Holy Spirit. Now, so after Philip has done what he's done and the people are, they're coming in, now comes the praying over these people to receive the Holy Spirit. For the Holy Spirit had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized into the name of, Jesus, of the Lord Jesus. So the infilling of the Holy Spirit has to be seen to. You have to see to it that that gets into the person, that they receive it. You have to intention as a child of God, if you're ministering to someone and they come to the Lord, you have to then see to it that they are indwelt by the Spirit of God on purpose. It's not an automatic. Then Peter and John laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. Give me this power as well, he said so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter replied, May your silver perish with you. You see, Peter, right there, identifies him as someone who's dead. Now this is a man who believed and was baptized. But he had not given up another spirit. He was still under the spirit of the enemy. Because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. In other words, the man was still under mammon. He was still under the God of mammon. His heart was still not on God's team. You have no part or share in our ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of your wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive you the intent of your heart. They felt that it was possible for him to repent of this but that he needed to know how serious this was and to get busy at it. For I see that you are, po now he saw this by the Spirit of God, for I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and captive to iniquity. Now get this, even what these men had brought by the Spirit of God was not enough for this man who was well-practiced, in the ways of evil.
Then Simon answered. Now I want you to understand that they have already given him an order here. They've already told him exactly what to do. Repent, therefore, of your wickedness and pray to the Lord. So they've told him to repent. They've told him he's way off. They've told him he cannot have a share in their ministry. And they've said that he needs to pray, okay, repent and pray, and perhaps God would forgive the intent of his heart. But Simon doesn't do any of that. He says, pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. What is this? This is the lay it on me God. This is always somebody else being responsible, not you. There's no responsibility here. He hasn't taken what they said. He didn't take any of it. He's not responsible before God here. And after Peter and John had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel. That was the end of Simon. Right there. That was the end. He never took their words to heart. This is how dangerous witchcraft is. There are those that will come to God in the last days, and Scripture says it. They will say, Lord, Lord, have we not done many miracles in your name? Simon was doing miracles, and Simon could have gone off and done miracles in the same way, but he knew that their power was greater than what he'd been operating in, and he wanted that. For what purpose? So that he could use it for the kingdom of hell. But does he know this consciously? No. But they knew it of him. They saw it of him. Now they told him to repent. Therefore, the sorcerer that I was exposed to was standing in a place that a man of God should have been doing some things that appeared to be of the Spirit. He was able to see things. He was able to tell you things. He was able to dazzle people with some things that he knew about them. But it wasn't by the Spirit of God. The man was not operating by the Spirit of God, and I had an opportunity to engage the demon. It was, it was awful. Now, I will say this about the Lord. The Lord told me, this was my this is I'm admitting a sin here. I was told by the Spirit of God not to do what I did. I went there, but I was told not to engage that man. I was told not to do this. And I did because I got curious and because I couldn't see the danger. And that was an excuse and not a reason. And that is a sin because I knew not to, and I did anyway. And I experienced a degree of damage from what that man did. These are very dangerous people. They will ruin your soul. And that's what they are about. The demon in them is about ruining your soul. They are about ruining you for service. They are about killing what God is doing. They are about killing God. Think not that these things are not about murder. I mean, they are. They're about murdering God. The enemy hates God. And that hatred is a murderous thing. So the demons in whom they operate, if they're big enough, they will come at you to ruin you. The thief cometh not but to, to, to kill, to steal, and to destroy. To destroy. To ruin you. 
Well, once I saw the demon, I saw it rise up. I heard it. It talked to me. The one thing that was vital and interesting about this man's ministry, because he was ministering to people supposedly by God, was that in the, in the teaching that he gave, because he would give a little teaching and then he would do things, there was no hope in the teaching. And after listening to it for a period of time, I began to notice its absence. You have to pay attention to what a person is saying and what a person isn't saying, what the Spirit of God is saying about what you're hearing. And it took a while of listening to what the man was saying before I began to realize that there was no hope in what he said. There was no spiritual hope there. He was drawing a crowd to himself, and he was attempting to draw a following to himself by acting like he was a spiritual man. And he was doing a very good job, actually. He convinced a lot of people. And he did get a lot of help from a number of churches on the projects that he was working on. They were only too happy to comply. You don't want the devil using you for his stuff. Make sure who you're doing business with, even under the heading of Christian. Make sure you know and test. Now, we just previously taught some on testing of the spirits. Okay, it's vital that you begin to learn how to see. This is vital, or you can end up being a tool of the enemy and not even know it. So, what sorcery actually is, is the not your will, God, my will. These are people who get baptized and say, oh, I got this, and take off on their own to go do whatever without God. Because after all, now they already got God, they have a really great feeling that they had, they had an experience, but they don't have God with them. You can have an experience and not have God with you. And if you continue to act that way and continue to pull on, there is a power available to man by man's own natural spirit that the enemy can work through. And it will look a little bit like the power of God, but it isn't. And it, it can take, you know, when you go to a jeweler and you've got a stone that's an imitation of the real thing, even a good jeweler sometimes has to really look at that thing before he can tell the difference. There are some imitations of certain stones that are that good. It's an imitation but it's not the real thing. And so it will be missing vital elements. In the case of this man, the vital element that was missing was hope. And he offered no hope in the so-called work that he did with the people that he did, but he made it look like he was offering hope without actually giving hope. He made his teaching look like it was about God or becoming like God without being. And you had to listen a while before you caught it, before you realized that it was missing major elements. In other words, there wasn't any God in it. And so therefore, by those things, faith, hope, and love, faith, hope, and love, he was missing major elements. And there was no love there. When you got right down to it, and the man was doing some of the work that he did privately with you. Now he's really going to help you. And that's where the thorns and stickers came out. And the destruction to your soul got really going. That got really heated there. 
He's going to kill you. He's going to ruin you. You're never going to be the same again. And he's using powers that don't belong to God. Powers that are under the enemy. And they are formidable. The enemy possesses formidable powers. So make no mistake. This stuff is real. And it's time enough that we not be silly-headed about it. But that we take what God has to say seriously. Seriously. Don't take him lightly. He means what he says, and he's serious about it. And if you can't understand where you are right now as to the seriousness, just know that he is. And that you should respect him. Now we know from Isaiah 11 that our Lord delighted in fear of the Lord. When you delight in the fear of God, the respect, the honor, the understanding that he is just so huge, he's so wonderful, he knows so much more deeply, and every word that he gives is so true, and it's true in a deeper way than you can possibly understand in the natural. You can plumb the depths of this your whole life, and you'll never get it all, which is wonderful. You just keep growing in it. It's alive. It's rich. It just keeps coming out. It keeps flowing. You keep, it's wonderful. And it says it was his delight. And it needs to be our delight too. There's a great song that I think almost everybody has heard, Amazing Grace. Through many snares and toils, we have already come. Amazing grace. Thank you, Lord. Father, your grace is amazing. It's outstanding. It, it's huge. It's beyond anything that we can describe as far as size. It covers every matter. It covers every heart that reaches out to you. Your grace the love that you have for the, your creation. Lord, we ask that you not miss a single one of them. Not a single one of us gets missed, and I don't believe you will. I know you won't. You've already said, and I know we're all coming in, those of us that, oh Lord, plant your word firmly in the hearts of the people who are yours. Plant it firmly into your people, that every single one that is yours will come in strength to your throne. Your body, Lord, on this earth. Protect us, guide us, lead us. Thank you, Lord, that your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.